Welcome back to another episode of Christian Natural Health. Today, I am very excited to have Dr. Jared Zeff with us. Dr. Zeff is a licensed doctor of naturopathic medicine and a licensed acupuncturist. In addition to maintaining a private practice, Dr. Zeff currently teaches at uh, Bastyr University College of Naturopathic Medicine in Seattle. Dr. Zeff is a, considered a traditionalist practicing a classical form of naturopathic medicine. He began a private practice in McMinnville, Oregon, based around obstetrics and family medicine. He was named Naturopathic Physician of the Year in 1989 for his contribution to the development of naturopathic clinical theory. In April 2002, he was given the first Lifetime Achievement Award in the um, Northwest Naturopathic Physicians Association for his contributions to, to the naturopathic medical uh, education. Welcome, Dr. Zeff. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So um, in your time in naturopathic medicine, what's changed since you started practicing? Like, have you noticed that cases have changed from the beginning to now? I would characterize it differently. I began practicing 42 years ago. Mm -hmm. In 42 years ago, there were six states that licensed naturopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. The two most liberal were Oregon and Washington, excuse me, Oregon and Arizona in terms of our practice privileges or practice prerogatives. Yeah. In Oregon, for example, the law specifically stated, you may not pierce the skin or mucous membrane for a therapeutic purpose, huh. which meant, now there were exceptions because we were licensed to do obstetrics, we were licensed to do minor surgery, huh. but in general, we could not do any kind of injection or IV treatment, it was against the law. Huh. Okay. Now, that has changed dramatically. Right. We, we could prescribe a few pharmaceuticals, but only those which were directly from natural origins, such as belladonna or even penicillin, which is a mold extract. Yeah. Now, in Oregon, in Washington, in Arizona, in many of the states that license us, I think there are 27 states which license us now, mm -hmm. We can do IV treatments. Those were clearly illegal 42 years ago. I can prescribe in the state of Washington any pharmaceutical that any general medical doctor can prescribe. So in Washington, in Oregon, in Arizona, I could practice almost indistinguishably from a medical doctor. That was clearly not the case 42 years ago. It would have been impossible. So 42 years ago, naturopathic physicians had to practice what I would call traditional naturopathic medicine, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is defined as a philosophy and a set of therapeutics, which include dietetics, herbal medicine, homeopathy, physical medicine of various types. Um, so 42 years ago, there were only what you might call traditional naturopathic physicians. Mm -hmm. Today, many of my colleagues practice a naturopathic medicine, quote unquote, that I wouldn't even recognize as such. They practice, their, their primary practice is based upon prescribing drugs and doing IV therapeutics, mm -hmm. which again was illegal 42 years ago. So there's been a dramatic change in the practice and in the education of naturopathic physicians uh, from when I started until now. Gotcha, gotcha. And so the individual cases that you see aren't different. It's just that the ways that you can approach them are different than they used to be way back then. Well, another thing that's different more in terms of the question you're asking is that when I started, most of my patients were what I might characterize as well hippies or people who were desperately ill. Uh, yeah. People who have been told they had no further options in conventional medicine, yeah. so they were desperately looking around for alternatives. Right. Today, my, my practice is based on what you might consider average typical people with all kinds of healthcare problems. Mm -hmm. uh, even medical doctors come to see me as, as patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the basis, the acceptance of naturopathic medicine has dramatically changed. Yeah. Yeah. The, the scope of patient population has what you might call normalized, mm -hmm. and we are accepted in ways that we were not accepted 42 years ago. Gotcha. Now, in terms of the kind of patients I see, mm -hmm. um, I see a broad spectrum from well babies to desperately ill seniors. Mm -hmm. every, every kind of, of illness that's not a surgical emergency or a 
basically a surgical or surgical orthopedic type case, that's what I say. Gotcha, gotcha. And so um, over the years, as you know, there's at least my practice consists of a lot of people who have chronic disease and also lots of toxicity from the environment, right? Right. And so that I think is also, at least in my much more limited experience, um, has potentially changed over time. Is there a way that you would approach those who are really, really sensitive to like everything in the environment that might be a little different than what you would do with, you know, somebody that was potentially able to handle a lot more, like from your from your philosophy? In a sense, there is, in that when I see somebody who is extremely sensitive, mm -hmm. part of my task is to try and determine why are they so sensitive and what can we do to make them less sensitive mm -hmm. people that can't walk into a grocery store because it makes them sick or can't walk down the soap aisle mm -hmm. because they get a migraine or something like that now most of the time these people have a severely congested liver or a, a, a reduction in the capacity to detoxify right. so part of the task then is to improve liver function but it, that's not the only possibility but i would say it's common in those cases gotcha yeah um, so in the kind of traditional uh, naturopathic philosophy, there's this concept of healing crisis. Can you define what that is relative to like a disease crisis? How can you tell the difference between them and what are they? Yeah, this is going to take a minute. <laughs> okay. I think it's important to the overall discussion. Um, conventional medicine is based upon a simple and er elegant paradigm, mm -hmm. the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Mm -hmm. So the task of the doctor is to, you come to the doctor, you're not feeling well, you expect the doctor to tell you what's wrong and to fix it, mm -hmm. okay? And so in that context, we have the ICD-10 uh, now, which lists something like 44,000 diseases. And based upon the disease, there is a prescribed treatment that's considered the standard of care. Some of these things are in development, but most of them are fairly well set, even though they may change uh, as time goes on. Right. So in conventional medicine, you come to a doctor, you may have five different diagnoses, you get five different treatments, you may even be seeing five different doctor, one for each different diagnosis, and the treatment is designed to um, impact the specific diagnosis that you have. In traditional naturopathic medicine, or what I would call real naturopathic medicine, mm -hmm. um, that's not what I do. Certainly, I'm aware of that. I'm trained and licensed to diagnose and treat disease. But the way I think about it is quite different. For instance, my assumption as a vitalist, and we can talk about that later if you want, yeah. is that the body heals itself. Yeah. The body is constantly trying to heal itself. If you cut yourself, you don't have to consciously do something about it. If you do nothing, the cut's going to heal. And if it doesn't, I need to figure out why. Mm -hmm. Because it should. Everybody expect if you break a bone, the bone's going to heal. The orthopedist sets it so that when it heals, hopefully it heals straight. Mm -hmm. But it's going to heal because your body does that. Your body heals. Okay. If you come to me and you're chronically ill in particular, my assumption is you should be healthy. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you healthy? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'm looking for is what has disturbed your health? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, a principal disturbance of health is wrong diet mm -hmm. or other what we might call hygienic, hygienic uh, elements, such as you're not resting, you're not exercising, you're under too much stress, et cetera. So the, the where, where I begin with most people with chronic disease is to try and remove or reduce or moderate those things that are disturbing health. Most commonly, get the diet right. Mm -hmm. Then I begin stimulating that self-healing mechanism or self-healing wisdom mm -hmm. using hydrotherapy, homeopathy, maybe acupuncture, things that don't add substance, but stimulate or push on that internal wisdom about how to heal. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are burdened by a lot of toxicity that has generated your illness, mm -hmm. or if you've been suppressed a lot with, with pharmaceuticals, which have literally taken acute diseases and turned them into chronic diseases, yeah. then as we re reduce or remove disturbing factors and stimulate healing, 
you'll start to feel better and better and better. But there, but the, the, that disturbance, some of that disturbance, some toxicities may be in the system that have to be removed. And as you feel better and better and better, you'll reach a point where the body now can discharge some of that disturbance. And so you get a, a, a you, this is typically what I see. The person starts to feel better and better and better. Then they say, I feel better than I've ever felt. And the next day they're sick. Mm -hmm. They have a fever. They're doing some kind of a discharge, mucus, maybe diarrhea, maybe some other kind of discharge. And as they go through that fever discharge thing, which looks like the flu or maybe a cold, they come out of that at a much higher level of health. Mm -hmm. That is a healing reaction mm -hmm. or a healing crisis. Mm -hmm. You've set the stage, you've cleared away some encumbrances, you've improved how the body's function, how the body functions as it starts to function better and clear away the disturbance. It, it gets to a place where it can now dump a bunch of garbage out and get to a higher level of healing. Mm -hmm. We call that a healing crisis or a healing reaction. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's different from a disease crisis or a disease reaction. Mm -hmm. In a disease crisis, although it can look the same, fever and discharge, you, you have not created the circumstances for healing. Mm -hmm. You haven't removed disturbances. You've been treating the patient and suddenly they appear to get worse, but they haven't gone through a phase of getting better and better and functioning better. They're just, they, they suddenly have a downturn. Mm. Um, you can see that one of the common ways you see that is, is with uh, bronchitis. You're treating the bronchitis, all of a sudden the person spikes a fever, they have trouble breathing, now they have pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And they're sp getting rid of a bunch of mucus. That's not a healing reaction, that's a disease crisis. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You have to understand the theory though, mm -hmm. to understand the difference. Right. And also it sounds like understand what's preceded it in order to identify which, which likely is this manifestation. Yeah. You're looking at the whole patient through time, how mm -hmm. they've been treated. Are the treatments suppressive or are the treatments truly healing and liberating? And, and in, the, in that case, you'll move into sometimes a healing reaction, although not everybody does that. But if you haven't done that and suddenly the patient gets worse, it's a disease crisis or a worsening of the disease. Mm -hmm. And um, so is there a difference so with homeopathic aggravation when you get the remedy right, sometimes people can ag aggravate. Is that the same thing as a healing crisis or is that different? No, it's, it's different. different. Okay. Okay. So, um, and have you noticed that over the years that healing crises have taken on a different manifestation than they used to? Or are they basically the same as they've always been? The teacher of my teacher, one of the predominant nature paths 100 years ago was Dr. Otis Carroll. Mm -hmm. Otis Carroll taught and experienced, he had a very large clinic. He employed 22 nurses doing hydrotherapy on patients all day long. He had a huge clinic in Seattle, I mean, in Spokane. Mm -hmm. He said that typically it took 25 hydrotherapy treatments to reverse cancer. My teacher, his student, told me typically he found it took 75 treatments to reverse cancer. Interesting. My experience is it takes 150 to 300 treatments to reverse cancer. Wow. Now, what we're seeing is a combination of things. Okay. One of them is the vitality of people has reduced mm -hmm. to a great extent because the, the medicine that most people have been exposed to is, ex, is increasingly more powerfully suppressive. Mm -hmm. So most people have had lots of vaccines, lots of antibiotics. They're taking three or four. I have people come to me, take the, the top one I ever saw was taking 50 drugs. Many people are taking 20, 25 drugs when they come to see me with chronic disease. All of those are toxic. Mm -hmm. They all burden the system, although they may be maintaining the person's life and have helped them. Mm -hmm. But as we truly proceed to healing, we've got to move them away from those drugs, which we can do as, as they improve. They don't need them as much. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't the case 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Plus, the food supply is different. Yeah. Plus, I don't, I don't know that the stress load is different. It's always been stressful to be a human. But um, <clears throat> we're surrounded by more toxicity. There are, <clears throat> we, 
there are literally thousands of industrial toxins in the environment and in our bodies. That, that wasn't the case certainly a thousand years ago. It wasn't the case 500 years ago. There were some. It wasn't the case 200 years ago, but it is the case now. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, you We can still find, for instance, DDT in the breast milk of most women. Mm -hmm. Even though DDT has been outlawed in the United States for what, 50 years? Right. Yeah. So it just persists. So yeah. these burdens didn't exist in people then. Mm -hmm. So the vitality of the population, I think, has reduced. Yeah. Well, and so that alludes to what you were talking about before, the concept of vitality and vitalism. Can you define that concept? Yeah, vitalism is a, an old concept. It was, it was discussed by the, the classical Greeks 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Basically, the concept is that I mentioned this earlier in a sense when I said there's a natural healing wisdom in the system. Vitalism is based upon the understanding that life is not simply a mechanical process. Mm -hmm. There's an element to life, a vital element that is um, ineffable. You can't see it you can't find it. It's difficult to define, mm -hmm. but you can describe it. Mm -hmm. It's the, the living nature of the living being. What's the difference between a live person and a dead person? Mm -hmm. the, the physical mechanics are, the, are, all the stuff is still there in the dead person, but something's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. That vitality, that living aspect, that living principle mm -hmm. is gone. Mm -hmm. Vitalism is based upon the idea that any living system has a vital element, almost supernatural, mm -hmm. that animates it. Right. That uh, uh, the, the, the opposite concept is what we might call mechanism. Mm -hmm. That life is an accident mm -hmm. that occurred accidentally three billion years ago when molecules began bumping together and accidentally uh, DNA formed and living beings could come into existence. Mm -hmm. It's all an accident. It's all a mechanical process. There is no living principle. Mm -hmm. There is no ineffable life force. It's just a mechanical process. Mm -hmm. So a vitalist observes nature and sees this vital element in living systems. Mm -hmm. Naturopathic medicine is fundamentally, or always has been, a vitalist tradition mm -hmm. in that we work with um, this wisdom that's built into every cell that mm -hmm. promotes healing, that moves toward healing, mm -hmm. and that is, that is difficult to define and is beyond the simple mechanics of the organism. Mm -hmm. Was that clear? I think so. So here's, um, tell me if this is, if this understanding is, is right or not. So identify and remove obstacles to cure. That's the toxicity part that you talked about. Build up the blood on the, you know, with it, with the, the, the building blocks that it needs. So that's get your diet right and all of those kinds of things. And then there's the third leg, which is that stimulate the vitality. And that's where things like hydrotherapy and homeopathy and acupuncture fit in. Is that right? Exactly. When you, when you, you when you give somebody a homeopathic medicine, you're not giving them a material substance. Right. Yeah. You're not giving them a molecular or mass effect like you are with an herb or with a drug. Mm -hmm. You're giving them simply an informational package mm -hmm. that stimulates this healing wisdom or healing potential to which this living vital organism responds and reacts. Mm -hmm. It's not substance. It's this other thing. Mm -hmm. Like direction. So... Uh, along those lines, since you mentioned botanicals, so those can of course be used in the same way that a medication would work from a suppressive standpoint, but then there's this eclectic tradition of botanical medicine. Can you just define the difference? How does, how does eclectic medicine fit into the naturopathic philosophy? Eclectic um, botanical medicine is somewhere between homeopathy 
and the, the pharmacology of botanical substances. Mm -hmm. In our schools now, most of the teaching in botanical medicine has to do with the pharmacology of the constituents of the botanicals. Mm -hmm. And botanical medicines are prescribed mostly on that basis as packages or combinations of certain pharmacologic uh, molecules produced by and contained in the plants. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, most dosages are uh, significantly higher than I was taught in school. For instance, John Bastier, famous naturopath mm -hmm. of the generation above mine, mm -hmm. uh, was one of my teachers of botanical medicine. Mm -hmm. And one of the common prescriptions he taught me was what he called heart drops. Mm -hmm. This is two parts crataegus, one part cactus. Mm -hmm. And the prescription was 10 drops before meals three times a day to improve heart function. Mm -hmm. Now, most current um, botanical prescribers would think that's ridiculously low dosage. Mm -hmm. You got to give at least a teaspoonful, if not more than that, mm -hmm. to have a pharmacologic effect. Mm -hmm. But the eclectic effect is based in part upon the energetics of the herb. Which, which puts it in the realm close to homeopathic medicine. So when you're, when you're prescribing eclectically, you're looking at the whole herb in its whole um, context. Uh, Boraki's Materia Medica and Pharmacopoeia, which is one of the um, homeopathic prescribing guides, is an eclectic botanical book. Mm -hmm. hmm. Where the dosages of the of the are often drop dosages of the mother tincture or tenth drop dosages of the mother tincture, which is a botanical preparation, and you're looking at the energetic picture as well as the biochemistry and pharmacology of the substance. So, a, eclectic botanical prescribing takes into account those other aspects, and the result of that is often the dosages are lower. But the effect is amazing. So um, what would be the difference? Like if you had a homeopathic dose of a botanical versus an eclectic dose, is it just that the, the, the scale is slightly higher? Like you're getting some of the substance left in the eclectic dosing versus with homeopathy or not? Is that the only difference? No, it's not the only difference. Okay. Uh, here, let me contrast it this way. Consider homeopathic cactus. Mm -hmm. Cactus is a major cardiotonic herb, mm -hmm. similar in many respects to digitalis. Mm -hmm. uh, it, would, it would be, you could easily prescribe 30 drops three times a day. Some people might even consider that low mm -hmm. to effect the cardiotonic biochemical um, biophysiologic impact on the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Dr. Bastier, as I just mentioned, told me essentially use three drops. Mm -hmm. So that's substantially less. Right. And part of that effect is going to be the energetics of cactus. Mm -hmm. The homeopathic dosage would use, would start at probably uh, one part per million. Right. at a 6x. Mm -hmm. So you're using in, in the homeopathic dose almost an insubstantial dose, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally energetic in its effect. Right. In the eclectic prescription, you're using a small dosage that in part has a stimulating effect mm -hmm. on the organ. In the conventional botanical dosage, you're using a much larger dosage which fundamentally has a biochemical effect on the organ. Ah, okay, okay, makes sense. So, um, so give me an example of some of, like if you can think of, of a few or one or two cases that really stand out in your memory, something that, um, that kind of illustrates the principle of application. 
Okay, now remember, I've I've been doing this a while. I know. <laughs> and so I have, maybe something more recent, I'm guessing. I have something like fifty thousand case files. I'm so sure. reaching back into my memory, right. one of the cases that stands out uh, for me the most um, is a is a man who came to me. Oh, probably in uh, nineteen ninety six, maybe around that time. He had what at the time was an untreatable form of leukemia, mild dysplastic syndrome. There was no treatment for it than there is now conventionally. Mm -hmm. He was told he had a year to live. Mm -hmm. um, he was a very uh, high level executive in a nationwide company. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, I have to live five more years in order to attain a pension that will sustain my family after I'm dead. Mm -hmm. So his goal was to make it five more years on a diagnosis where he was told the prognosis is one year or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's how I treated him. First of all, I determined if he had any dietary elements that were uh, fundamentally disturbing his health, mm -hmm. I found one. Mm -hmm. He was fruit intolerant. Okay. That's, uh, fairly uncommon, but it's significant. I told him no fruit and explained how to do that. I began him on a series of, series of constitutional hydrotherapy treatments, mm -hmm. once a day, five days a week in my office mm -hmm. for quite a while to push and push and push that, that ineffable healing force as we're at the same time detoxifying. Right. I gave him a variety through time of homeopathic medicines as his case changed mm -hmm. and as things erupted. I gave him botanical medicines to improve the function of his lymphatic system, uh, especially, uh, and of his immune system to try and normalize or moderate this, this uh, white blood cell cancer, essentially. And um, I made sure that his nutrition was adequate and appropriate and tried to help him reduce the stress in his life. And in that regard, I prescribed homeopathic medicines based upon his picture. The first one I gave him was Nux Vomica, uh, which is a fairly typical prescription for somebody in that circumstance, but that changed over time. I worked with this guy for several years. And the first thing we saw was that he didn't get worse. Mm -hmm. He stayed the same. His um, monocyte count was quite high. Monocytes should be less than 10. His, his was in the 70s or above, which is part of the signature of that kind of leukemia, uh, mono, monocytic leukemia in a sense. And um, we just kept working with him. Things would happen. One time he developed a, uh, a, a kind of severe edema. I gave him homeopathic apis, which cleared that. Mm -hmm. And we just worked through these problems over time. And um, to make the long story short, we began to see his white blood cell count slowly normalize. The, the lymphocyte, he was also seeing a medical doctor, an mm -hmm. oncologist who was a friend of mine who was following the cancer but had no treatment to offer. Okay. And so we saw his, his monocyte count go into the 60s, the 50s, the 40s. He never got below 10. I think it, the lowest it ever got was 16, but he lived something like 15 more years. Nice. Past retirement age, he yeah. retired. He and his wife bought a little organic farm mm -hmm. and uh, he was working the farm for several years. And one day he died of a ruptured aneurysm that no one knew he had. He didn't die of the cancer that was supposed to kill him one year after diagnosis. Wow. So. That, that, was, that was at a time when I was trying to figure out if these traditional therapeutics could effectively treat cancer. He came to my office and we, <clears throat> we helped him. And so that's, that's one of the cases that, that I always think about that stands out for me. I can see why, that's amazing. So, um, and what would you say, based on your experience of where you've seen that we've come from and where we are now, do you have a vision or a hope for the future of medicine generally in the United States or beyond? Yeah, I said this a number of years ago. Um, Southwest College surveyed a lot of 
I guess I could call us older doctors, although I don't think of myself that way. Good. <laughs> uh, John Bastier was an older doctor. I'm a younger doctor, but Good. my hair is not brown anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did a survey of doctors in the field and asked us for a vision for, 10, for 25 years into the future. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I said was that 25 into the future, the average medical doctor will be using a lot of naturopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. That naturopaths will be seen as experts in the field of natural medicine and natural healing, um, rather than as this kind of pariah class of fake doctors. And that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I said a few minutes ago was some of my patients are medical doctors. Yep. When I started in practice, the local medical community tried to run us out of town. Mm -hmm. they, they, they owned the lab in town, the medical doctors, and they refused to let us use the lab. Um, I mean, I could go on about that. There was a great deal of prejudice against us. A lot of that has reduced. It's not entirely gone, but now in the state of Washington, I am considered a licensed physician. There's three categories of physician in Washington, MDs, DOs, and NDs. That was not the case 40 years ago. Uh, in the first place, there were very few of us. In the second place, the conventional system didn't consider us physicians. In the state of Washington, in Oregon, in Arizona, in a number of places, we are primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's a substantial difference. And that change that I saw was that more and more people, uh, particularly after COVID, COVID was a big wake-up call for people because they saw some of the difficulties, let me say, in conventional medicine and in the regulatory agencies um, that did things that don't really make a lot of sense. And that's all I want to say about that. Um, but what, what we're seeing is more and more people are looking at naturopathic medicine as a system composed of a small group of experts in healing and in the use of natural healing methods and substances. That wasn't the case 40 years ago. It is the case now. And I, I expect it's going to be more the case. I'm having medical doctors send patients to me. I'm having pediatricians recommend some of their patients come and see a naturopath. Um, we are becoming more and more accepted mm -hmm. and we're starting to see some conventional medicine adopting some of our methods, mm -hmm. even though I don't think they have the philosophical background to understand why we do what we do, but some things are obvious um, and that's, that's becoming more and more widespread. Mm -hmm. And another thing we see is the pharmaceutical industry is I, I would say disturbed at our existence because when I started, the impact of naturopathic medicine and what you might call alternative medicine was negligible. And now we're a multi-billion dollar industry. And uh, <clears throat> what we might call a competing industry doesn't like the competition. Mm -hmm. We were not a competition 40 years ago, but more and more people are seeing the value of the kinds of things we do. The use of homeopathic medicine is widespread. The use of botanical medicine is widespread. More and more people are interested in, in utilizing what we do. And that's, I predicted that 20 years ago, and I think we're going to see more and more of it as we move forward. Gotcha. Yeah. So is there anything that I have not asked you that you want to make sure that you leave with our audience? <laughs> it's my cat's all question. You don't have to have an answer. <laughs> well, um, Here's one. I have a very good friend who's a medical doctor. We've been buddies for a long time. He's looking forward to retirement. He, in fact, he's about 10 years younger than me, and he's getting close to retirement. And to me, the, uh, the, the idea of retiring is, why would I want to do that? Yeah, I yeah. love what I do. I love watching people heal. Um, I, I love teaching younger doctors. I've got three of them in my clinic. We're about to bring in a fourth to help train people up. Mm -hmm. uh, we're even expanding our clinic in order to do that. And I find the medicine we do fast. I would do it for free 
-hmm. Why should I retire? Right. It, yeah. it is delightful to be to do what I do. Mm -hmm. There's no, I haven't experienced burnout. I've been doing this for 42 years. I plan on doing it for 42 more years. And I think a lot of my colleagues feel the same way. Those that practice traditional vitalistic naturopathic medicine are in love with the medicine mm -hmm. and, and just want to do more of it and want to get better at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So where can people go to find out more about you? Uh, we have a website, www.salmoncreekclinic.com. Everything they want to know, they can find there. Sounds great. So I will link to that in the show notes. And thank you so much, Dr. Zeff, for all of your time and wisdom. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for asking me to do this.